As Shostakovich began composing his fifth symphony in April of 1937, he found himself at a personal and creative crossroad. The year before, his opera Lady Macbeth of Bitsensk District and his ballet The Limpid Stream had been denounced in the government-controlled media as deliberately inadequate to the needs of the Soviet people. His fourth symphony was withdrawn shortly before its premiere, and he was shunned by colleagues and friends. At a time when Stalin was consolidating his power by directing a bloody purge that would result in the death of more than a million people and affect every sector of Soviet society, standing outside the cult of personality that was raising the dictator to the status of a god was extremely dangerous. Stalin was depicted as the hero of the Russian Revolution, the wise teacher and leader who was guiding the Soviet people to a radiant future. Any evidence that the current state of affairs was somehow unsatisfactory was either censored or ascribed to malign elements. In the artistic realm, this government-dictated delusion manifested itself in the concept of Soviet realism, in which materials and concepts derived from real life were depicted in a direct, accessible manner that glorified communist values as defined by the state and portrayed Soviet existence as prevailingly happy, healthy, and and industrious. Artistic abstraction was denigrated as formalism and decried as a feature of the West's insidious decadence. Soviet realism in music was characterized by a reliance on folk materials, clear tonalities, melody, and easily understandable form. Dissonance was to be used sparingly, and the atmosphere of the music was expected to be optimistic. Critiques of new works weren't based on grounds of taste or effectiveness. Art was to be judged according to its utility as propaganda. And since the symphony is ultimately a public genre, simply as a result of the resources it requires to play and perform, Shostakovich's decision to write a fifth essay in the form was fraught with risk. <laughs> Even a cursory comparison between the musical languages Shostakovich employed in his fourth and fifth symphonies reveals a radical shift in style. While the fourth is formally adventurous, enormous in scope, highly dissonant, utterly ruthless in expression, and imbued with the syntax and spirit of an ultimately short-lived Soviet modernism, the fifth symphony, written between April and October of 1937, doesn't venture significantly beyond the symphonic model Tchaikovsky inherited from Beethoven. The harmonic language is prevailingly consonant, the large-scale structures are supported by clearly identifiable tonalities, and dissonance is relegated to its traditional role as an element that conveys a sense of conflict. Its darkness to light dramatic narrative follows a convention Beethoven had introduced more than a hundred years earlier in his Fifth and Ninth Symphonies. This profound change in Shostakovich's style provoked a controversy that continues to this day. Although artistic quality and meaning aren't tied to either simplicity or complexity, Western musicians and critics saw this retrenchment to a simpler musical language, a much more conservative mode of expression that would characterize the composer's music until the last decade of his life as a case of an artist abandoning his aesthetic principles in the face of external pressure. For many, the act of writing symphonies during an era increasingly dominated by atonality, 12-tone music, serial composition, and electronically produced music was, in and of itself, a reactionary artistic statement. This viewpoint has been challenged by many of Shostakovich's colleagues and friends, as well as some scholars who have asserted that many of the composer's most famous works included coded expressions of dissidence. This idea began to gain traction in the West with the appearance in 1970. Of the book Testimony, which includes the provocative subtitle The Memoirs of Dmitry Shostakovich, as related to and edited by Solomon Volkov, an ancillary description that immediately raised questions about the work's accuracy and authenticity. The Shostakovich that emerges from the pages of Testimony is firmly anti-Soviet and asserts that his music often contains veiled messages of support for dissidents and protest against the government. The ostensibly triumphant ending of the Fifth Symphony serves as a prime example. The Shostakovich of Testimony claims, This rejoicing is forced, created under threat. It's as if someone were beating you with a stick and saying, Your business is rejoicing. Your business is rejoicing and you rise, shaky, and go marching off, muttering, our business is rejoicing, our business is rejoicing.
As is the case with many of the issues that revolve around Shostakovich and his music, it's not difficult to find authoritative support for positions that conflict with each other, sometimes directly. Thus, when we are examining a work as controversial as the Fifth Symphony, it may be most useful to recount the reactions of those who heard the piece in its earliest stages of public life. The symphony was immediately embraced by the Soviet public. It became so popular so quickly that the government, wary that this enthusiasm could be interpreted as a repudiation of their previous denunciations of Shostakovich, importuned state media critics to reframe the work by advancing the myth that the composer had given the symphony the subtitle, A Soviet Artist's Reply to Just Criticism. But the reaction of the 2,500 Leningraders who packed the Great Hall of the Leningrad Philharmonic on November 21st, 1937 to hear its premiere revealed a much deeper level of understanding. During the third movement, men and women in the audience were seen openly weeping. As the finale progressed, the listeners began to rise to their feet, one by one. The music had a sort of electrical force. The deafening ovation that followed shook the columns of the Great Hall, lasting more than half an hour. The conductor Mravinsky finally came to the front of the stage, holding the score high above his head, as if to say that it was not he or the orchestra who deserved this storm of applause, these shouts of bravo. The success belonged to the creator of this work. Thank you.